Welcome to episode 133 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Keith O'Neill from Irish psychedelic electronic band Extronauts about their debut album, The Alchemist. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Colin Angus from The Shaman about Moship, his new project with Digital Habitat. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating, and leave a comment. Before we begin, here's what's been happening on Access Noise this week. In the review section, Sam Williams has been listening to the new self-titled album from Boy and Bear. It's the Australian indie rock band's fifth album, and their first to be released independently. Sam says the band's decision to record with a hybrid of analogue and digital techniques leads to a new, slightly more polished sound. But everything's kept down to earth by singer Dave Hosking's lyrics. Also on the side, we have tour news from the murder capital, new music from the Boo Radleys, and a feature exploring the link between poker and music videos. And the Foo Fighters continue the build-up to the release of their 11th album with the release of an epic 10-minute track with accompanying short film. The Teacher is the fourth single from But Here We Are. Watch it now at accessnoise.com. Having started out under the moniker The Dead Heavies, Extronauts have released their amazing debut album, The Alchemist. Taking inspiration from 60s psychedelia just as much as it does dance music, the band's debut long player sees Extronauts wearing their influences proudly on their sleeves. In this interview, lead vocalist and guitarist Keith O'Neill talks about being discovered by Creation Records founder Alan McGee, writing and recording the album, live shows and lots more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Keith O'Neill from Astronauts. Hi, Keith. Welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Hey there, Mark. Thanks many for having me on. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. It's great to have you. Where are you today? What, what am I up to? Where am I? I'm, I'm, yeah. here, I'm here in a relatively sunny Amsterdam. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, just chilling at home. Um, had a long, nice long weekend, drinking some beers, relaxing. So, uh, been a pretty chill day. So, yeah, pretty chill vibes overall. Happy out. Uh, well, Amsterdam always has chilled vibes. So, what took you from sunny Ireland over to Amsterdam? <laughs> just somewhat less sunny Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, but just you know, um, we uh, like most people, I would say, from our neck of the woods, you know, um, visited here on a on a holiday or you know a long weekend kind of thing, and. Uh, Ended up coming back a couple of times and thinking, you know what, this is a cool place. And uh, yeah, so um, you know, lived away when I was younger and just um, liked the vibe over here. And yeah, just went for it. So I've been living here for a couple of years. It's great. Nice one. It's one place I've never been. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd recommend it, man. There's mm-hmm. great, um, great music here. A ton of great venues. Super arty kind of scene. There's lots of DIY stuff happening. Lots of cool venues. Um, so yeah, totally recommend it. And super chill and super small, right? So you can you can cycle anywhere you want in 10, 15 minutes. So how bad, right? No, it would it definitely would have appealed to me back in my younger days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh I don't know what would make me want to go there and I, I, I it's a place I've always wanted to visit, so I, I definitely will. Yeah, check day. it out. Shoot, shoot, shoot. give me a shout and I'll bring you out for a beer. Oh, absolutely. So you're back with a new band, a new album. I mean, the yeah. band was originally called the Dead Heavies. That's right. So why did you decide to reinvent yourselves as astronauts? Really good question. And uh, I think you've kind of already answered it there, which is um, it was about reinvention, right? Um, so it was about doing something different. It was about having the mandate to do something new. And it was about putting kind of a, a full stop, right? Do you know what I mean? So obviously we um, started as the dead heavies, had a ton of fun. Um, you know, and did some great stuff. And uh, over time, then obviously, you know, the, the lineup in the band was changing, and uh, we had some people kind of come and go and and, and had a, a different lineup. And obviously, as with anyone, your musical taste changes over time, stuff you're listening to, the stuff you're inspired by, all changes, right? As, as you age and as you grow and you get into different stuff. And so, we were trying a ton of different things as well. And 
musically it was coming from a different place um so really it was about you know naming is a powerful thing anyway right i've always thought that that like uh there's something to people's names for example right like you know does you see you know you, you meet certain people and you think god i've never met a john that wasn't sound you know what i mean like dependable kind of fellow right and you wonder then what's in a name you know um and so really for for extra notes then it was about giving ourselves the license to do something different and not that we had like i'm not being pretentious and thinking that we had a ton of history that we had to separate it's not like a new order joy division thing you know what i mean like it's a uh, but it was really about okay, look, let's re- let's recognize the fact that that this is a new band. You know, we've got new ideas, we've got new songs, and uh, new sounds, and uh, and and let's make it so right. So you know, and and it was great because it it's renewal for for us as well as much as it is for for anyone else. You know, so it wasn't a hard decision at all. It wasn't a hard decision, but yeah, there was some there was some. I mean, you're you're letting go of a. It's a risky decision, right? So you're going from let a, a band that people know you you've had that name and. I can certainly tell you that that renaming a band is much harder than even naming one, <laughs> right? Because you know, as, as well, tough as it is to name things, it's even tougher to rename them. Well, you know, as you say, it's not an uncommon thing. You know, you mentioned Joy Division, who were, who became New Order, who were also Warsaw way at the start before that, and go. then you would have you two who were the hype Oasis, were the Rain, yeah. you know, Blur it, it were go- like um, Seymour or something they were called, weren't they? Yes, yes. I looked up what astronaut means. <laughs> and it and it says a person that consumes ecstasy and feels aeronautic, a feeling of bliss, as if one were in space in an astronautical sort of way. Yeah. Is I that think, it? I think that's if I think that's as good an explanation of what being an astronaut feels like. Um to, as we can find. Um I think, you know, to me, what astronauts is about is about that kind of exploration right and um, not of just outer space but of inner space right uh and of time and we've always been psychedelic chaps do you know what i mean so um yeah so it's embracing that and, and the idea is i suppose to reflect the music which is um gets increasingly psychedelic and a little bit more exploratory i think so so i think that's a pretty good description for sure yeah yeah Congratulations on the new record, The Alchemist. It's an absolute banner. It's it's probably and I'm not just saying this, it's it's probably one of the best albums I've heard in ages. Oh wow, thank you so much, man. That's too kind. It's really great to hear. No, it really is. I've been blasting it nonstop. When and where did you start writing and recording the album? Um writing, I mean, happens all the time, right? So um writing is something, you know, a lot of the songs start with with me. And, um, you know, just just at home, you know, what 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 uh, to kill time, pick up the guitar and, um, you know, start up Cubase, you know, get something going and uh, get a vibe going or get a beat going and, and, and just take it from there. It's what, what what we do to kill time, you know. And so the songs tend to start from there and then flesh out an idea. Everyone contributes um, and we, we kind of filter it through, you know, all of our own kind of uh, influences and experiences. Um, I think uh, it's been written over the span of years, really, because, you know, it's constantly writing and constantly rewriting. Um, recording wise, it was done across a couple of different sessions. We had um, Jags Cooner producing, who produced the uh, Primal Scream. And, you know, he's done a ton of stuff, Reverend the Makers, you name it. He's an absolute legend. And uh, he's kind of the unifying thing across all the different sessions. We did it in tons of studios with, with different engineers and stuff as well. But Jags is the one kind of constant through it. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a collection of songs that's written over a good, a good few years, really, because, um, you know, even though they're, they, they, they can be written at different phases in your life. Uh, I think when you put an album together of 10, 11, 12 songs or whatever, you realize that there's these constant themes that even though time might have moved on, maybe they're the things that we always, or you as a person are constantly kind of grappling with, right? So, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it, it took a, couple of years of writing and, and we recorded over about five or six sessions as we did in Grace Lodge and different studios. And uh, yeah, it was a great time doing it, right? Uh, but even to this day, I mean, we're still writing, still recording. Um, it's just what we love to do, you know? Yeah, you mentioned Jags, great producer. How did he get involved initially with you guys and, and what does he bring to the recordings? Yeah, so, I mean, how we got involved was as simple as as... as someone getting a track to him um some demos so like i said we would start off with a song and usually i'd knock up a demo 
uh, you know, nowadays you can do it yourself on, on a computer, right? And uh, um, knocked up a few demos and, and managed, he managed to get a listen to him and, and he was in straight away because I think he saw, even though the demos were pretty, pretty rough, <laughs> he, uh, he saw the potential in him, um, I suppose, even more so than, than we did at the time. And he was super psyched to get working with us then. And um, for what he brings to the thing, he's really song focused, right? So obviously he's a bit of a dancey background, you know, um, Sabres of Paradise and working with Wilder Roll and all these people. And he is very sonically focused as well, but ultimately he's more song focused, right? So the thing that he does more so than anything is he keeps you focused on the song, right? Like doesn't matter how good your hi-hat pattern is, right? <laughs> if you don't have a good song, you have to be, people listen to the song. They don't listen to the instruments and keeping us focused on um, on what matters in a song and, and making sure that every part of the song is as good as it can be. And then in the studio, he's just a great buzz, right? You know what I mean? Like studios can be long, you know, 10, 12 hour days, maybe not so much sleep in between those days and having someone who's uh, constantly a good buzz and knows how to um, get everyone going. We would do these vibe up sessions where before we, we would do some some takes and when we were getting close to doing the real take, we'd come into the studio and he cranked the, the monitors as loud as he could go, put on whatever song it was that was there. Uh, we were feeling that day, get some beers and then go back and do the real thing, you know? So um, he brings that vibe as well as that kind of, you know, love of songwriting and, and a real push for, for excellence, I suppose. With, with you being in Amsterdam and I, I take it the rest of the guys are in Ireland. Initially, did you have to sort of send files like remotely yeah. and stuff and, and demos initially? Yeah, 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 exactly. That's how it happens. Right. I mean, you know, the last sessions we did for the album, um, you know, we we purposefully didn't practice, right? So I would I would send I had files I would send them to Jags, and he'd be like, okay, yeah, yeah, let's do this one or let's do that one. And some of them were you know sixty seconds, ninety second snippets, right? And um, and then we got to the studio and and I, Jags and I played them the snippets just basically before we were going to do them, <laughs> right? So it was like you know previously we 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 would get together and do some pre production practice really get out the the arrangements and so then when we get to the studio we're pretty you know just getting the takes and uh, but for this one we kind of use that separation i suppose as a way to uh to do something different right so rather than you know practicing it and knowing it inside and out we would like play the songs and they were like, right, let's just let's just do it, <laughs> right? So it's a different vibe. But yeah, I mean, everyone nowadays in the band nearly can can do some sort of home recording. So uh, we can bounce stuff around, put extra things on it, add a verse, add a chorus. And, I, you know, it's one of the best things about, uh, you know, the internet has done some terrible things to music, obviously. <laughs> let's be yeah. honest. But it's also done some good stuff, right? Let's talk about some of the songs on the album. There's so many great songs on the album. You know, we'll have to talk about some of them, some of my favorites. What one of the oldest tracks on the album? Um, I believe is Lazarus, and Alan McGee, the legendary Alan McGee, heard the track while he was visiting Ireland and yeah. a few a few years back, and said it was a modern day classic. Alan Alan's a big supporter of the band, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was, and we were we we had plans to work together, but we were basically scuppered by COVID. So one of the reasons why. Um, there was a bit of a delay in the album coming out was because we were kind of primed and ready to go. Alan had heard her stuff and uh, and Lazarus, I think in particular, was the track that kind of grabbed him, came, saw us play um, in, in a little rehearsal space in the middle of uh, County Waterford. And uh, yeah, he loved it, said it was a modern classic and was like wanted to work together. So we would just went and got some uh, some pizza in the pub down the road. And uh, yeah, we were going to work together, um, but then COVID came, kind of scuppered those things and, and you know, plans changed and stuff like that. So so, but yeah, he was a great guy, had tons of great stories and, uh, you know, funny, funny guy. And uh, yeah, he loved that one. And I think that's one that's connect, connected with people in, in a funny way the most, right? Um, which is funny because when I was writing it, it was kind of not not intensely personal, but it's, it's, it's introspective song, right? You know what I mean? It's kind of kind of a sad song in a way, right? You know what I mean? It's about loss and redemption and, and rebirth and, and all that kind of thing. But it's really connected with people. Um, and it's funny to like have someone like McGee come along, you know, and 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 see something like that in it and call it a modern classic. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's it's it it, it was cool, it meant a lot, and uh, yeah, people love that one. The latest single, "Everybody in the Night," about yeah. the track you said, "Music is our religion and the dance floor is our place of worship." I love that. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, it, it's funny that song once uh, once upon a time had a line in it of Hallelujah, but um, yeah, I mean, that's what the song is about, I suppose, is just pure, pure escapism and and pure, um, you know, that kind of decadent, you know, nightlife culture that we all kind of grew up in, right? Do you know what I mean? Um, regardless of where you're from, really, or or what you'd like to do for a living, the majority of the world goes out Friday, Saturday, Sunday night and tries to either find themselves or forget themselves, right? And uh, that's what it's about. It's a celebration of that, do you know what I mean? And I was just thinking, you know, it's a funny thing to kind of compare to religion. And then there you go, right? Lazarus is another song that has religious overtones. You think I'm not a religious person, right? And why am I writing in all these religious <laughs> themes, right? But, you know, it's that, it's that, for me, it's that line in it, which is, you know, um, we don't need faith to believe when it feels this right, you know? So like, um, you know, being on a dance floor or, or being wherever it is, um, when that tune kicks in to your tune or with your friends or whatever, and you're blowing off the steam and there's that minute where you have that kind of epiphany and you can really, really escape from whatever your life is. You know, it's, um, that's what really what it's about. Like if, if it feels that right, like it doesn't need faith to believe in that religion or that God, right? Because it's, it's right there. You can feel it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just great days. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking back to the nineties. <laughs> this is it. This is it. You know, great, I, I, great, great I, I came, I came up around the same time, so I think we might have had some similar experiences. And you know, some yeah. of them were in some very, very, very dingy places. Do you know what I mean? And so, you, you would argue they were truly transcendent. Do you know what I mean? If you're telling someone that you had an epiphany in, in, in you know, uh, yeah. a, a, an old petrol station, basically, <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. So yeah, if, that's what it's about. Yeah, if you know, you know. And I think as well, you know exactly. And I think as well, you know, it's um, it's 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 a great topic because I think it's one that everyone relates to, right? You know what I mean, everyone has their own different version of that place or that different song or that different thing, but everyone I think has some sort of memory like that, you know. Absolutely. My favorite song on the album is. I hope I'm pronouncing this properly. Debonair. Hey, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. I love the, it has a real sunny 60s psychedelic vibe to it. It really cheers me up. What can you tell me about that track? Yeah, that one um, started off um, with um, Peter, the bass player, had had a kind of a demo that he had done of this chord progression, which which turned out to be the verse and Deb in there. And it was very small faces kind of vibe, right? Like real kind of 60s kind of uh, English uh, R&B kind of vibe. And um, I think we jammed it a couple of times. And then there was a time a couple of months later where I rented this house in um, in Inishtig and uh, in County Kilkenny and uh, went there to write some songs and brought the lads up, you know, and uh, Peter came up, Peter Voter came up one night and uh, we just we just wrote it there and then, right? So added on a chorus, uh, did the lyrics, and then obviously you bring it to the band, and we've got Tom on percussion, right? And he's rocking the congas and, and all that. Ed, obviously, who plays the keyboards, is also plays um, trumpet, and so we've got you bring the brass in. Do you know what I mean? And that's what I mean by like it takes from something. The demo that we did of it that night, I remember, was almost kind of folky, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And um, and then you bring it to the band, and you've got that rhythm section, and you've got the the, the brass stabs and stuff like that, and then it turns into. To something completely different, do you know what I mean? And that one's always super fun to play live as well. I think the kind of rhythm that it has, and like you said, it's got that sixties kind of psych pop kind of thing. Probably one of the poppy songs that we have, I think. And uh, and yeah, and the lyric, I suppose, is really just about you know, again, internet and uh, I think social media probably, in the sense of um, you know, this idea that you can choose to create a vision of yourself that you just show to other people. Right. And, and it's not necessarily a reflection of reality. And, you know, um, if you get to decide, you know, um, who you can be, what's the point in trying to develop a personality, right. When you can um, potentially just mimic these trends or these things that, that, that people show. So I suppose it was kind of a comment on that really. No, it's a great track. Yeah. And for, I'll go from that there. And then a new age of innocence, you know, which is, Probably my second favorite track on the album. Oh, great. You know, it, it begins like the Runats, "Be My Baby," yes. yeah, old, yeah. old Phil Spector vibes, but then it just changes. Yeah, it's funny. I I love that one too, and we're massive Phil Spector fans, right? So honestly, have to we have to stop ourselves every five minutes trying to not put that "Be My Baby" beat in there. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> 
So uh, yeah, we we love that stuff. Phil Spector, Ron Etz, that whole water sound thing, and you know Motown and stuff like that. So so it's a it's a funny one because yeah, and this is a great example of of Jazz's influence of um, he loves that '60s stuff. So for him, it was a right buzz doing that kind of classic pop thing, and but then in the chorus, it, it turns into um, more of a disco kind of vibe, right? Uh, and it's got again great rhythm, and uh, I think we were kind of there was a Phoenix tune, I think called Too Young. I don't know if you know that tune that we were uh, kind of vibing on at the time in the studio that we were going for the similar kind of vibe. So, so yeah, we all just love, you know, that kind of, so to get a song and get that uh, 60s thing in there and uh, all the percussion and then get it to kind of that disco y dancey place. I think that's kind of really a little bit of a mission statement for the band in a way is like, you know, we love that classic stuff, you know, but we all, and we love those sounds, those 50s, 60s sounds, but we love, putting things into kind of a more modern or more more danceable kind of realm, you know? Well, well, that's what's great about the songs on the album because it, it starts one way and then you think, right, it's going to go in this direction. Then it just goes completely in a, another direction, you know, to what you're expecting, you know, especially that song as an example. What were you listening to sort of um, while you were writing and recording the album that might, might have inspired and seeped in to the album? Sure. I mean, there's tons of things, right? I mean, there's, there's stuff that you listen to that... Um, sonically has an impact right so for example like you say you listen to phil specter you hear that sound with the castanets and the tambourine or whatever and a ton of reverb and you know that's a that that sound almost has an emotional resonance with you and that's a touch point that you want to put into your own music so you know you always go back and you look for those things and you bring them into your own music and certainly um we were listening to some kind of more kraut rocky stuff like can and noi and stuff like that um, which kind of feeds into some of the more relentless kind of sound and stuff like we used to dream. Um, I think New Order is a touch point as well. And, and something that I realized later how much we were kind of borrowing from that idea of having this electronic danceable music, but with basically really kind of sad songs <laughs> right mm-hmm. over the top of them in the sense that the melodies are quite, quite sad. Um, influences wise, I think songwriting wise, it's like, um, do you know the Bruce Springsteen album, uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town? Right? Yes. And uh, that was a big one. Uh, and I think you wouldn't necessarily hear it in the, the, the sounds or, or the music, but, um, I think this idea of, you know, adult themes in songwriting and this idea, like country music would say, you know, four chords and the truth, right? And um, I guess this idea of this economy in, in, in lyricism and the idea of really trying to say something as much as possible, even when you've got these really super spacey, oblique kind of sounds that you're singing over, having kind of a, a more honest um, lyric, right? And uh, not just getting into platitudes where possible and trying to say something and speak from some sort of experience. I think that album was a big, uh, big uh, part of it. Sonically then, I mean, I was really into stuff like Nick Hakeem. Who's like a kind of a neo soul singer from America who's amazing and does kind of we love anything psychedelic sounding sixties kind of nuggets compilations anything that sounds a bit out of the ordinary so and then you know seventies funk and stuff like that because obviously we've got a six piece and we've got the percussion right so anything that can lay down a groove or you know so it's it's a bit of everything uh, and anything which is why I think the music sounds a bit eclectic you know. Yeah, it, it does. It sounds very eclectic and exciting, you know, and, and it's a great listen. Yeah, cheers. What song on the album do you feel most connected to? Yeah, I think for me, the song that I feel most connected to is probably the last song on the album, which is called Fan, right? And uh, it's a bit of a, a slower one and a little bit down tempo and a little bit more... Um, let's just say a little bit, maybe a little sad even, right? Or a little reflective. And uh, I think the, the one reason that one connects to me is I think the lyric is quite personal for me personally. And uh, I think it kind of informed a lot of the the songwriting decisions and a lot of the, the way that we ended up moving forward with the band, because again, it's, it's, it's got this kind of dancey kind of thing, right? Even though it's, it's, it's lower tempo, it's still quite groovy. And uh, and it's got some funky orchestration and, and instrumentation and stuff, but it's kind of got a really honest lyric and it's and it's about loss and about you know recognizing stuff that's gone wrong. And uh, I think that's kind of opened up into a mission statement for for the band a little bit. And yeah, that one's always connected with me personally. I also really like um, we used to dream. Um, I think again, 
that one was was written you know pre-pandemic but then when i listened to it during the pandemic and uh, after the pandemic when it came out it was like oh it could be written for covid and uh, uh i think th- that lyric as well of you know l- loss of um not innocence but then um, but hope and and the idea of fear and who you're becoming and, and stuff like that and that with the really relentless beat and stuff like that i just love that one so I get drawn to the darker stuff for some reason, you know. Like uh, the, the happier ones, I don't know. They seem to, uh, they seem to. There's something. To, to, I don't know if there's something that feels less authentic about them, even though they're they're authentic, right? So like a song like Uptight is certainly semi-autobiographical, <laughs> right? So, um, you know what I mean? It's it's just funny. The ones I suppose that are up a bit more upbeat feel can feel a bit more throwaway, right? Do you have any live shows planned? We're currently putting together something. It's 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 a little more difficult these days because we've got um you know post COVID there's still a ton of um backlog in, in venues and stuff. But we're trying to put together a, a string of dates that we can do over a week or two. So we should be announcing something hopefully soon. So we'll keep you in the loop. Well, hopefully you're coming to Ireland. Oh well, sure. Without a doubt, have to get me washing done. You know. <laughs> <laughs> No, because what happens mostly is, especially English bands that, or some American bands as well, they'll, they'll come to Dublin, but they'll, some sometimes they'll come to Belfast, sometimes they won't. So yeah, hopefully yeah. you can come to Belfast as well. I don't think they realise how, how, how close it is, especially these days. You'd be there in an hour and 20 minutes or whatever, right? I know. So um, I think they, they, they think it's more further away than it is. No, for sure. I mean, like, I'm super happy to go up north. We've got family um, up there. And um, yeah, I mean, mad to get back out gigging now. Um, we've done some gigs since we came back as astronauts, and they were the first kind of pre or post pandemic gigs, and 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 they were great, you know, so semi emotional. You know, when you're doing music for years and you're, you can get tired of lugging your your amp down a field for a festival, or you know what I mean, <laughs> and getting into the car and driving back from Loud or whatever, you know what I mean, four in the morning. Um, but you know, with when that stuff goes away, like with everything, it was really like, oh wow, you know, geez, a renewed sense of uh, you know, desire and joy of doing it, you know. No, I'd love to see his live. I mean, what what can people expect at an astronaut's gig? It's super high energy, right? Um, like I said, you know, number one, when we play live, we come to dance and we make people dance. Um, you know, we've got a super rock and rhythm section, you know, between Sav on the drums, Vogue on the bass, and Tom on percussion. Do you know what I mean? Um, we like to stretch it out a bit live. So, you know, um, a lot of the songs will take them a bit further than they are uh, on the record. Um, not afraid to jam it out. Gets a little bit psychedelic at times. Get in on the trumpet for a bit of a wig out. And, uh, yeah, it's an experience, right? It's, it's high energy. Uh, and generally, you tend to get people up and, and keep them up. So where do you see the band heading in the next few years? What ambitions do you have for the band? I think, you know, ambitions really at this, you know, nowadays it's, um, you know, like we talked about with the internet, right? And, and how music, music industry has changed so much. And, uh, I think nowadays success is, is, is potentially different than, than what we would have class successes before. And so for me and for, for the band, I think, you know, success for us is getting, continuing to make music, continuing to be passionate about it, getting to play to people. Um, and to constantly keep developing the sound, you know, I think what's, what's next for the band is, you know, make more music, record more music, try new sounds, right? Try things we haven't done before and just push the envelope and whether that's to the future or to the past, I don't know, but just keep pushing, right? And yeah, connect with as many people as possible. Like, you know, it's funny, but, you know, even one, two people connecting with your songs is an amazing thing and such an, a lucky and fortunate thing. Do you know what I mean? So. So for us to, when we play a, play a gig and we bust out Lazarus or whatever at the end and uh, to see people's reaction to it and stuff, you know, it's a great place to be and it's super lucky. Well, it, le- it is easier these days, obviously, with the internet, as we mentioned at the start, to connect. Um, some bands embrace streaming, some bands can't stand it. How do you feel about streaming and has it helped astronauts? Yeah, I think it's helped, right? I think streaming in general is, is a good thing in the sense of, you get your, your your music to more people, right? The mechanism for distribution of music is, is removed from from kind of the the main major label kind of system, right? So it's easier and more democratic to get out there. I think where things are challenging in this day and age is number one, bands are expected to be good songwriters, good musicians, um, 
social media managers, content creators, right? Publicists, right? All these things. And I don't know, but most musicians I meet are just good musicians, right? Do you know what I mean? So if you think about like, um, and I hate to use this kind of historical thing, but um, so many good bands that I know, you know, would have been bigger, could do more, but, you know, they're not content creators. Do you know what I mean? And nowadays it's about, you know, tr- you know, feeding an algorithm and, uh, you know, making sure that you pop up in people's timelines. And, and I think there's something lost in that. You know, for a start, I'm a big fan of mystery and music, right? Like if you think of the bands, that you, some of the bands you really love, you didn't know anything about them and you certainly didn't need, you know, daily check-ins with them on TikTok or whatever, right? So I think there's something lost in the sense that a lot of the music that can break through now, don't get me wrong, some of it's great, but um, a lot of it can be because people are good at self-promotion, really, right? Which is a good skill to have for sure, but I think um, the, the sad thing is that there's lots of good quality music and bands and stuff who who aren't good at that, and, and you know, they're potentially missing out, and an audience is missing out on them, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. But then sort of back in the day, you had bands like the Stone Roses who very rarely did any interviews and, and they had that mystery, as you say, I around love, them. Yeah. I love, yeah. you know, even when Jungle launched, remember that band, Jungle? Yeah. Like they didn't play, there was no pictures of them, right? Like someone like Joy Paul, right? So you know that mm-hmm. guy? And there mm-hmm. you go, he's like released an album, two singles, never done an interview and he's, you know, he's he's got that, that mystery about him, you know what I mean? And then, uh, yeah, I love that. And don't go, don't get me wrong. That didn't work for everyone. And, uh, but we are in this age of oversharing and oversaturation of most things, right? And, uh, I just feel like there's a certain, certain mystery missing, but that's just me. What do you think about the advent of AI in music when producers can add, for example, Liam Gallagher's voice, uh, the track using AI technology? Does, does that worry you as a songwriter? I believe that, you know, yeah, I mean, there's the different applications for it. I believe like a, a reading an interview or with someone and they were saying in Nashville, for example, that a lot of the younger songwriters have chat G- GPT out now when they're writing songs, right? So that, you know, that maybe they're stuck for a line or maybe they're stuck for a bridge or for a verse or whatever, and they'll chat GPT. I tried. I asked ChatGPT to write me a few songs, right? And I actually did a bit of a competitive thing where I where I took some of the themes that I'd written my own songs about, like Liquid Air, for example, is about the uh, Liquid Air of Chernobyl, right? I watched this documentary mm-hmm. on the, the the Liquid Air in Chernobyl who had to clean up all the mess and all died terribly, and um, and that's where that song came from. And um, and so I'd like, for example, ask ChatGPT to write something like that, and it was pretty pretty crap. Um, I don't know. The thing with the with the voices, I mean, it's just a novelty, right? I mean, like you see them pop up now, like, you know, the Beatles sing God Only Knows. And it's like, OK, it's interesting for like two seconds or whatever. Right. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I think really where it, where it has a chance to subvert is um, instrumental music. Right. Like if you think about stuff like EDM, you know, or, you know, that kind of stuff. I think, you know, it's pretty easy that's pretty algorithmic music anyway to begin with, right? So I think the one thing, and auto-tune maybe this this proves this a little bit, but the the human voice is where the emotion lives in music, right? And that's why people love singer-songwriters and where it's just like a guitar and like a cheer or some shit, right? And um, so I think the AI stuff like doing the voices and stuff is, is probably not going to connect in a real way. I think that will fight out, right? But I think when it comes to helping people write songs or, you know, making, hey, make me a, you know, go a trance tune, you know what I mean? That's like 16 minutes long and 228 BPM or something. That could well be a possibility. I think the lowest common denominator in music will be the ones that suffer from AI, right? Because, uh, I mean, any AI is only as good as the, the human has programmed it, right? And music has infinite variations. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not too worried. Just a few more questions, Keith. Yeah, yeah, far away. I like to ask my guests the following questions. For us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. Mm-hmm. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories to? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose it's probably like um, when it comes to memories, um, I think maybe Booker T and the MGs is one for me, right? And I think the reason why is it's, it's not necessarily, like I say, because of the because of the songs itself. But it was a time I think when uh, I was younger and I uh, was really starting to connect with uh, 
with other musicians and, and getting into different types of music that I never would have uh, listened to, right? Soul music, um, you know, getting outside the kind of the rock or the whatever was indie music was on the radio at the time, right? In the, in, in the late 90s and uh, getting into older soul music and uh, psychedelic music from the 60s and stuff like that. And so I think when I listen to that music, it reminds me of, you know, a time when, um, you know, sitting and listening to music was, was um, the one thing that I did every day and made time to do and, was um you know a different time and the time of discovery and a time of uh you know carefree kind of uh getting out and seeing the wider world and, and having a ton of fun yeah so so some of the Booker T and the MG stuff is definitely that and plus one of the best bands that ever for people who who, who don't listen. <laughs> they're they're a they're a band that I've never really delved into. So what album would you recommend me to start off with? Um I think you know it's instrumental it's instrumental music, right? So you can kind of start anywhere, right? Because um a lot of it is is quite similar. I'll tell you an album that's that's worth listening to is um they did a uh a, 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 an entire album where they covered the entirety of Abbey Road, right? That's called McLemore Avenue because that's that's the road their studio, the the stack studio was on. But like you've everyone's listening to them anyway, because they I mean they play on all, all the Opus Red and stuff, right? Uh, you know. Staple singers, anything really that came from Stax has Booker T and the MGs on it, right? They did but, Green Onions, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, Green Onions, yeah, all that yeah. stuff. Well, the, the, the tunes, I would say, Time is Tight is one, and uh, Melting Pot is another one that you should listen to, definitely. Went to see, went to see Booker T live once, and he told a story about him when he was 14. He wrote this song, and it was the first song he ever wrote, whatever, and, and he sent it off, and uh, someone recorded it, and that song is Born Under a Bad Sign, right? So it's like, right. wow. Hey, you wrote that when you're 14, man. Wow. Okay. Start to give up. <laughs> <laughs> what song or album is your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasures. Oof. I mean, uh, there's probably tons of them because um I like cheesy music as well if it's if it's melodic, right? Um so I mean stuff like even, you know, more than the feel, right? That song. I love that song and I'm always obsessed with it because um it's a song that has like two choruses to me, right? And um, the instrumental break before the chorus, right? Think about it. You just never hear that in music anymore, right? Where you'd have a, a verse, right? That builds up and then the instrumental break and then back into the chorus. And uh, in a way, the instrumental break is almost like a bigger chorus than the chorus after it. So yeah, stuff like that. I, I love anything if it's, um, if it's super melodic um, and uh, over the top and more for it, yeah. And he played all those instru- instruments himself, I think, and, and, and produced record, it. Right? And recorded it himself, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. he spent years recording that yeah. in the basement, right? And, I mean, that was back in the day when he didn't have a MacBook, right? Like, he would have had yeah. a machine and, you know, a, a console and all that jazz, right? So, I mean, it's incredible when you listen to him, right? So, Keith, that's that's me done. Is there anything else you would like to mention before we wrap up? Anything else coming yeah, up in the media future? Check out The Alchemist. It's out the 2nd of June. Um, it's a couple of years of our lives and we put a lot of blood, sweat, tears and beers into it. And, um, yeah, I mean, thank you for having us on and for anyone that's listening, you know, it means a lot. Um, and we hope you enjoy it, right? And keep your eye out. We're on Facebook and all that extra notes music where we'll be creating great content weekly. Um, and, uh, yeah, just get into it and, uh, yeah, hope to see you all soon. Okay. Okay. No, thanks very much for, for doing this. Really enjoyed it. Now, cheers, Mark, man. Thanks a million. It means a lot, man, for giving us the time, for taking the time to do it. So, yeah, cool. Nice All right, Mark. Cool. Appreciate it, man. Nice to meet you. And uh, cheers for that. You're a legend. Yeah, good luck with the album, mate. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you, man. It means a lot. You're too kind. All right, Keith. Take it easy. Peace. Bye.